I've been talking a lot about prayer over these last uh, few years, and uh, I believe we are in the beginnings of a, a global move of the Holy Spirit uh, to return the first commandment to its place of promise that Jesus gave it. And we've been talking about that. That's a series we're in right now, but it's just, as you know, it's a theme for me right now. And today I want to introduce somebody who is really on the front lines of prayer to make that happen. And if you're visiting, this is going to be different than, than normal, uh, typical weekend. But I wanted you guys to have the privilege of meeting Billy and, uh, and hearing a bit of his story and to hear what, uh, just a, a little bit of what he's seeing and what he's hearing. Billy is the director of... Uh, International House of Prayer in Atlanta, Georgia. You were the founder of that. Uh, it's a 24-7 prayer center. Now, I, I want you to wrap your heads around this. That means <laughs> there is a team of people, just like you saw our team out here, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, Christmas, Easter, every day <laughs> included, worshiping, leading worship in prayer. I mean, that, that, that isn't even possible. I don't know how that's possible. But, but I'll you know, say this, your yeah. team this morning is a lot better than a lot of our teams. <laughs> and that's one way that it's possible. <laughs> but uh, to me, that is one of the greatest signs that God is up to something because you just can't stuff, sure, do yeah. stuff like this. What you did can't be done. Uh, and... <laughs> I always, this is, uh, if you're 20-something, this is not a put-down, but you can't do it with 20-something-year-olds, right? <laughs> well, and think about it, 20-something-year-old worship and prayer people. Yeah. It's like herding cats. Exactly. Exactly. No offense, <laughs> all right? But, you know, I mean, we're... ADD is their spiritual gift. Right. We're the me generation, and we had you guys. And so, you know, uh, so, but, wow, God is... A, you know, blowing my mind with this. So you were a former youth pastor, right? Big church, successful. Yeah. How in the world did you get into this? So, uh, right. So my story. I mean, uh, I was a part of a church in Atlanta that um, really I was there from day one. I, I, I was a part of the the first six people of this church. Incredible church there. And uh, in about 13, 15 years, we grew to about 3,500. And, and I'm the youth pastor there and, and, you know, fill the pulpit when the pastor's out of town. And, and we're experiencing, you know, all the good things of ministry. You know, yeah. lots of people coming, lots of lives being changed. And in our youth ministry, uh, God began to move in a pretty profound way. And we had this season where, I mean, so many people were, so many young people were coming in and, and, and getting touched and saved and delivered. And so many beautiful things were happening. And it really stirred my heart for something more of God. And, and the only place I could find more of God was more time in prayer. And so the Lord kind of snuck me in to, I knew that you had to have prayer to have revival or to have a move of the Spirit. But he kind of changed my paradigm because prayer was the only place that my heart was feeling, you know, satisfied. And so he takes me from there and then... And, and then totally switches what, you know, he's, he's, kind of, he's kind of the king of the switcheroo, you know. <laughs> You're saying yes to one thing, and he's wow. leading you to another place, and uh, switches where we're going, and um, the next thing I know, all I want to do is plant a house of prayer that does prayer all the time, and I, I never was the guy that thought, hey, let's just pray all the time. Like, that sounds horrible, bad <laughs> <laughs> to me. I'd heard about the prayer ministry in Kansas City that was doing it all the time. I thought, who would ever do such a thing as that? I mean, what? You have to lose your mind to do something like that. And so here I am. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. But it's real. It, it really is. It's it is, teams yeah. like this, lots of young people. I mean, morning, noon, and night, Christmas, New Year's, Thanksgiving, Easter, 2 a.m., 2 p.m. It hasn't stopped for seven years. We've just celebrated our seven-year uh, worship-led prayer amazing? meeting anniversary. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, and I'm the I'm the most surprised guy of the bunch. Yeah, I mean, I, 
I mean, you were told in, in the initial phase of this, this is impossible. <laughs> I mean, this, this can't be done. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, being a part of a successful church, you know, you kind of get to think, well, we can just do whatever we want. I'll just do this. And right. so when I first started getting the vision for night and day prayer, I thought, man, I'm going to learn everything you need to know about night and day prayer in a weekend. I thought I would go to like a conference or a seminar, kind of get the download and just go do it. And uh, I end up spending a year training and trying to get the, the rudiment ideas. I mean, there's a whole, I mean, there's a whole story in the scripture about night and day prayer. This isn't just some idea from man. This is something God's done. It's all in the Bible. And so, I, I mean, all these verses start coming alive. I didn't even know we're there. And my point is, when I first, God sort of first gave me the vision, I was like, surely we can do this. And, and within that, after that year of training, I was like, there is no way this is going to happen but God. And we started with 40 hours a week. It grew to 75. It was 120. And then it went to 168 hours, which is 84 prayer meetings a week, two hours each. That's 24-7. And it went to 168 hours. And I was the most surprised guy around. I looked at our team when it started happening, and I said, hey, do you guys actually think this is really going to happen? And they said, yeah. And I go, well, I guess I do too. I mean, I was the most surprised guy. We haven't taken a break in, in seven years. And people sometimes, they go, so why do you pray and worship all the time? And I just, there's a bunch of reasons biblically, but the key reason is Jesus Christ is worthy of worship every second of every minute of every hour of every day. That, that's it. Yeah. It's about Jesus. And there are so many questions. I, I, I mean, so many things I wish we could talk about here. You guys pray for everything. I mean, you pray literally because you're praying so much. You cover every major issue and every... All sorts of justice initiatives, 1040 window, missions. We pray primarily for the church in our city. That God would... I mean, we, I, I fell in love with the church when I started praying for the church. I thought I loved the church, but I realized I loved my church. But you know, there's a whole big body of Christ out there that are all of our brothers and sisters, and Jesus loves them just like he loves us. Mm. All sorts of different faiths. I mean, traditions of faith, I should say. Not different faiths but traditions of faith within Christianity. He loves everybody that names the name of Jesus. And when I began to pray for the church, pray for his bride, oh, man, I started feeling the way he feels about his, 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 his people. And so we pray for the church. We pray for missions. We pray for justice initiatives, all sorts of different things, government, everything. I get texts from Billy. I mean, we've known each other for a year and, or, or less, and I get texts from him during the week. I'm praying for you. And when he says that, he means it. He's doing it. No, it's he just really true. melts me. I mean, this guy has. I pray for Ron Tucker. I pray for Grace Church. I love you people because I prayed for you a whole bunch. Right. Y'all are really cool. I think the Lord thinks you're cool. <laughs> I think the Lord thinks you're cool, too. Uh, you've written a couple books. One is on the end time prayer movement. Uh, oh, man, I know it's a huge can of worms, and I'd love to get into a lot more than we can. But uh, give us a basic understanding of what you see happening and, and what you think this is all about. Yeah, so um, the idea of 24-hour prayer or night and day prayer, it's, it's, like, it's, it's like this great idea that everybody goes, oh, wow, that's so, that sounds so sounds amazing. Great. And, uh, but it's really like the, uh, the ab roller, <laughs> you know? <laughs> everybody sees the commercial for the ab roller. They go, oh, man, six-pack abs. Yeah. You buy the ab roller, you get it at home, and it's like, hey, this kind of hurts. And like, I can't eat fried food anymore. And this is not as fun as I thought. And so here's the thing. That's a good explanation. The idea that it's happening is way beyond any kind of human zeal. And here's the thing that's happening. Is, uh, and I've, I have a little bit of an opportunity to get a picture of what's going on around our nation and other nations. And there really is right now a global, a true global prayer movement that God is putting together and the idea of 24-hour prayer or night and day prayer, it is filling the earth right now in the most unexpected places. And uh, last year, we, uh, we had an amazing open door for us with the underground church in China. And, uh, you know, we've heard stories about the revival in China and the underground church, and, and it's real. I mean, to this day, a million people are coming to the Lord every single month in, in China. It's, it's the most... Is yeah. that not amazing? That is amazing. I mean, it's the most aggressive 
move of the Holy Spirit the earth has ever seen, ever. I mean, you can go through church history and you won't find a million people a month anywhere. And so the Lord threw these doors open for me to be able to go and interface with these pastors and leaders in China, and it's been, it's been absolutely mind-blowing. And uh, so I've got this one pastor that we've connected with, who we've got a relationship with, and I had the opportunity to train some of his leaders, and well, he's spoken in our environment a couple times. And, and so when he introduces himself, he always says, I have one of the smallest churches in China, and he just kind of puts his head lower a little bit like this. And, and so one time I just... I asked the interpreter, I said, so how big is this church? She said, oh, it's about a million. That's the one with six zeros. That's staggering. (laughs) And he's just, I mean, he's a couple years younger than me and just a regular guy and been in prison for Jesus. You know, I mean, all the stories are out of control. So I was there in November and, uh, and just, I mean, just the most precious saints you'd ever want to meet. And my uh, contacts, they set me up with this church. It's a, it's a church of uh, 7 million. <laughs> Moderate size. Yeah, it's like three times the size of St. Louis. And, um, <laughs> and they set me up to go minister in this church because it's, they, the, my guys had heard there's a prayer room there. And so... I, there's a woman that runs their prayer ministry, and I'm kind of, I get to meet her before I'm going to go to, to this church. And, I, and so I said, I heard you have a prayer room. Could you tell me a little bit about it? Tell me what you're doing. And I asked through an interpreter, and the answer comes back. We have a 24-hour prayer room that's been going on for over a year. And, and I know that they don't know about International House of Prayer Atlanta or any of the prayer and worship things that are happening, you know, that we might be familiar with. And, and so I'm thinking... Maybe she misunderstood me because I just don't know that this is really translating. And so I said to my interpreter, could you just ask her again? Just ask her another way. Just, just ask her the same question a different way. Tell me about your prayer room. And this time the, the answer comes back. We have 24 prayer rooms that have all been 24 hours a day for over a year. And I'm, and I'm looking at like the dog at the new sound. And I just don't know what is for sure she didn't understand. (laughs) So I asked my interpreter, just ask again, try it this way, you know, are you doing actual prayer? Like what, you know, I'm just trying to rephrase it. And this time the, the, the lady goes, no more questions. She goes, tomorrow you see, tomorrow you see, no more questions. Okay. So we go and they, I mean, Ron, you know, they, They've got to run you around because you can't be an American in the countryside of China because it's, a, it's an immediate sign that something's wrong. This is communist China. They still arrest Christians and imprison wow. them. So wow. they're running me around, and the sister is really nervous, and they, okay, wait here, put your head down. Okay, run out of the car, and they run me down an aisle, this, this alleyway, and I'm into this church compound. It's a house. It's got a church in it. Seventy beautiful believers gathered in this room sitting on children's mats, wow. and, uh, and they're just precious, hungry for the Lord, you know, and all the markings of having been through the ringer, and I get to talk to the pastor, and I said, I understand you have a prayer room, could you, could I see it, and he said, oh, absolutely, and they take me up the staircase, and this, it, the most beautiful piece of furniture in this whole place is this mahogany door. That's the door to the prayer room. And it's got this sign written above it in Chinese. And I asked him, I said, so what is the sign? It's in Mandarin. And he, and he said, uh, it says, don't enter here unless you're serious about your watch. Which, that wouldn't go very far in America. And they're not talking that watch. No. They're talking about the watch of prayer that the they're about to take. Prayer. And I, I'm like, oh, man, I'm, this is serious. I'm about to get into something. And they open the door. I walk in. There's these two little Chinese ladies on their knees, and they're weeping. they got their Bibles out in front of them, and they're weeping before the Lord, just just rocking gently. And and, and I said, now, this has been unbroken for 24 hours for over a year. They said, yes. And I realized I walked into what I've been praying for, that God would raise up his house of prayer all over the nations. 
And I stand right in the middle. It's not just me. I mean, there's thousands yeah, praying these but, prayers. But they're the, yeah. And I walk into the middle of the yeah. answer of my prayers, these little ladies, and man, they look at me and they turn to me and they say, please pray for us. <laughs> I'm like, this, is, this shouldn't it be the other way around. And, uh, and so I do, and I say, please pray for me. And I mean, the bottom falls out, and I'm weeping and trembling. And it turns out that their church of 7 million is broken down into 24 sections and each that covers the whole nation of China, and each one of those sections has a 24-hour prayer room that's been continually going for the last over oh, a year, about yeah. you know, 16 months. That is phenomenal. They've never heard of any house of prayer in Atlanta or any of these worship leaders or this. You know what I'm saying? They don't know mm -hmm. anything that we're familiar with, and it's happening. It's happening in places like China and Indonesia and the Philippines. It's happening in the Middle East. I mean, I'm going to be in Egypt. I'm going to be in Lebanon. I'm going to be in Jordan. There's houses of prayer all through the Middle East. There's a global prayer movement that God's bringing together right now. It's, it's a sound he's released through the body, and his bride is responding. Gosh, Billy, that's amazing. You, you told us stories last night I want to get back to, but this is, this is kind of built on... The, 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 the concept of the 24-7 worship that goes on in heaven. Yeah. And what prophetically in, in Scripture? I mean, is it Joel's prophecy? Which, is that the... Well, there's a bunch of them that lay it out. I mean, to me, the clearest one's Isaiah 62. Okay. You know, and so, again, to co contextualize it, in, in the throne room, it's night and day worship and night and day prayer. There's actually prayers going on. Jesus leads prayer meetings for us. It says he ever lives to make intercession for the saints. Like that's actually happening right now, really. This isn't some wispy thing, this mm -hmm. is real. There's real worship, real prayer going on before the throne of God. That's, from wh that's the place from which he, he rules everything, the place of night and day prayer. And so in the Bible, Isaiah 62 lays out a clear picture that this is God's agenda for how he's actually going to wrap up this age and birth the next age. And in Isaiah 62, verse 6, he says, I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem, and they shall never hold their peace day or night. He's talking about prayer people, intercessors. He goes, I have set them in place. He's speaking prophetically about the future. He says, they'll never hold their peace day or night. And then he encourages the watchmen, and he says, you who make mention of the Lord, talking about the prayer people, he says, don't keep silent. Do not keep silent and give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. And that phrase, making Jerusalem a praise in the earth, is talking about Jesus coming, oh, yeah. his return, and him ruling the nations from Jerusalem. You know, we've kind of, sometimes we have these wispy ideas about the second coming, like maybe we sort of all, you know, turn into like little cherubs wearing togas, playing harps, floating on a cloud somewhere, you know. But the Bible is clear that there's, this thing is actually going to continue on for quite some time. And Jesus, real Jesus, is really coming back to the planet. And he's going to release the kingdom of God all over the earth. And so he sets up prayer. And he, he, he declares that prayer is going to be one of the key realities that God releases on the earth unto the Lord's second coming. And it kind of makes sense. It really does make sense. Because the throne room is worship and prayer night and day. The, the throne room of God, Revelation 4, it's night and day. They continue around the throne. They never cease singing holy, holy, holy. Well, it makes sense. If Jesus is coming here, he's just shifting the atmosphere of the planet to a, play, to a, a thing that he's used to. It's night and day in the throne room. Now he's releasing night and day on the earth. So we're still going to be praying even when he comes. What's prayer? Yeah. Conversation with God. Yeah. The end of the whole thing, guys, it's all about this. When everything, when all the devils are bound, Satan is thrown in the lake of fire, when, when every kingdom thing that's got to get done is done, and it's us and Jesus, we're going to have one thing left, our communication life with Jesus. Prayer is not just a means to the end. It is the end in itself. It's all about hearts relating to Jesus in intimacy. And so he set up the construction of things, and this is how the kingdom works. He's asked us to participate with him through prayer unto the nations all having a massively awesome 
prayer life, which is us talking to Jesus, interfacing with Jesus, drinking of his affections and love and, and, and talking Man. back to him about our hearts. This is where this is going. God and us in partnership and relationship. Ooh, I still want to get ahead of us here because <laughs> that is so profound. You could say that like 16 more times, <laughs> you know? I mean, the impact of that, the reality of that. But, okay, so what are some other signs? I mean, evangelism yeah. is a... Yeah, huge. So Matthew 24... It's a key chapter. And if you, want to, you know, if you want to do a study, study Matthew 24. G Jesus' own disciples asked him, what are some of the signs of your coming? And he begins to break down things in Matthew 24. He just lists a number of things. Well, one of the key things he lists, he says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness, and then the end shall come. So Isaiah 62 tells us there's a global prayer movement unto the Lord's second coming. Matthew 24 tells us there's a global preaching movement that will happen in all the nations of the earth, and then the end shall come. Well, here's the thing. Right now, there is such a transition taking place in the missions movement. The main leaders of all the different missions organizations, the main missions organizations, I'm talking about YWAM, Campus Crusade for Christ, Wycliffe Bible Translators, Operation Mobilization, they have 5,000 missionaries on the field. All of them have come together and for the first time really ever, they've got all the metrics. They know how to measure where the unreached people groups of the earth are, what languages they actually speak. And they've put it all together. And, and according to all of them, a joint effort to figure out what's it going to take to get the gospel preached in all the earth, they're all saying that we are on about a 20-year journey right now, that within 20 years... And that's, cons I mean, that's conservative. They're being conservative. Some of them say 12 to 15, yeah. 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 But they're saying within the next 20 years, and I, I'm using that number just to be conservative, the gospel will be preached in all the unreached people groups on the earth. Well, that is what Jesus said. The, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the earth as a witness. And then the next phrase, and then the end, the end of this age will come. And so these are not like, you know, television prophecy preachers that are trying to freak everybody out for an offering every week or something, you know what I'm right. saying? These are the heads of all the main missions organizations in the earth, and they're all saying, we've got a 20-year window, and that's going to be fulfilled. The Lord is going to see to it that the gospel is proclaimed in all the earth. And the interesting thing is they've come together. I mean, when you say they've come together, they've literally come together. Yeah, and joint meetings and joint efforts together. And are united in the whole idea that prayer is, is kind of the focus, is the, is the absolute focus. Well, and that in itself is a sign and a wonder. I mean, the missions guys who go, you know, running to the hardest and darkest and sort of throw the prayer up, the Hail Mary on the way, those guys are now saying, and, and the prayer guys who are in the closet and, you know, you ever wonder, like, did you guys ever think there were some lost people out there? Like, there's right. always praying. Well, now the missions guys are saying it's got to be the prayer movement, and the prayer guys are saying it's got to be the missions movement. These two movements are converged. It's kind of, you know, for us, we're like, oh, it's a new thing. God's converging the prayer and missions movement. But actually, if you look at it in the scripture, it was always in God's mind. Right. There would be a global prayer movement and a global missions movement as one reality, and a singing movement, a worship movement as well. But for somebody who grew up with it, and, and, and saw this for years, exactly what you just described, the missions people and the prayer people. For this to come together, the way these guys, I mean, I, I watched a roundtable discussion of these guys talking about prayer, talking about 24-7 prayer, talking about uh, building the base out of prayer, and I'm thinking, this is a sign, guys. <laughs> This is deal. not just happening. This doesn't happen. This is, this is a God thing on the biggest level imaginable. Let me give you a thought on that. When I was in China, I asked, uh, I asked the, the pastor of that, that, ch that church that had those prayer rooms, I said, uh, where did you get the vision for this? And through the interpreter, he said, oh, brother, we, got, we had this from generations past. We've always believed we wanted to see the gospel taken down the ancient silk roads, through the 1040 window, back to Jerusalem. And we've always believed for us to be able to take the, the, the gospel through the hardest and darkest regions of the earth, it would take 24-7 prayer to be able to, to mobilize that push of the gospel through the last parts of the, of the nations of the earth. Well, those Chinese leaders 
who, who don't have any reference to what these other guys are saying are saying the exact same thing because these missions guys are saying it's got to be night and day prayer to see the gospel taken through these last 7,000 unreached people groups man, as oh the man, engine man. and the impetus to see it happen. I mean, do, do you realize the implications of this? Jesus said, okay, now I know people get into this. You can't know the day or the hour. But he said you're supposed to know the season. Absolutely. You're supposed to know the season, and you're supposed to watch and pray. And we are probably, we have kids in our children's ministry and student ministry that are going to be alive when the Son of Man comes back to rule and reign. And, uh, and those of you, you know, who are my age and above, uh, if... If we die, we're going to be back here in just a few years. <laughs> have you thought about that? We have got to be living for eternity. We have got to be about eternity because it's not just these things. I mean, there are all kinds of other, when you start reading the Matthew passage. Yeah, are, no, there's challenges, converging. there's trials, there's judgments. Jesus, but you know what? The story of the end of the age is really about Jesus. It's about Jesus coming, yeah, birthing his kingdom that. in fullness. And so often people get kind of spooky, like, oh, end times. And so that's what Revelation is about, huh? Well, yeah. I mean, it's about Jesus. And, and, and so often we emphasize, well, the devil and 666 and uh, Mark of the Beast and computer chips and, uh, you know, and it's that's kind of good. spooky. And, and there are those details in the book of Revelation. But the reason those details are there is because the Lord is trying to let the church see how he is going to unfold his plan Oof. to drive the enemy, to drive the usurper off the planet and to take possession of every nation. The father has promised his son an inheritance, which is a bride across all the nations of the earth, a people who love him with all their heart. And the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's actually what it says, Revelation 1.1. It's the revelation of Jesus and how the father has laid out an amazing plan for Jesus to come and, and take possession of the inheritance the Father's promised him. Revelation 1, the, that chapter, there's like 30 different details in there about Jesus. It breaks down what he looks like in his glory. I mean, his, his face is it's shining like the sun. His eyes are, are burning with fire. His voice is like the sound of many waters. This isn't just sort of poetic language. This is reality. This is what the glorified Christ, this is what our Jesus is like in his glory. And so much so, so intense, so amazing that his best friend John, when he sees him like that, he falls down as a dead man because it's about Jesus' revelation. It's not about all these spooky things. It's about Jesus. And that's really what the end of the age is about the coming of Jesus and the birthing of his kingdom in the earth. I heard someone say uh, that, you know, we, we get so amped up about the global globalization of things, and again, it's the Antichrist thing, and oh, it's coming, it's coming. And he said, this person said, this globalization movement is all being orchestrated by Jesus because he's taking the throne. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he is coming back to rule the earth from Jerusalem. Absolutely. And I mean, it's, it's just the reality of that just sort of blindsides you with, what have I been <laughs> worried about? I mean, this is... He'll have a people, uh, it says it twice in the book of Revelation, from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation who love him with all their hearts. That's why God's heating up our hearts, isn't it? Yeah. That's why he's calling us to prayer because he wants us in. We, that's the beauty of prayer. And the, 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 I mean, one of the most fascinating things about God is that he actually does what he does in partnership with people. Oh, that's so good. Like, if you and I, I mean, I, don't, I won't speak for you. If I were God, I'd snap my fingers and just have things the way I want them. I wouldn't use broken down people. I'd just be God and go, boom. Yeah. There it is. I'm God and shabam. But God, because he wants relationship and not robots... He sets up the construction of his kingdom to function on a principle called prayer by which we actually agree with his heart and ask him to do what he wants to do. He's not going to do this thing apart from partnership with us because he wants relationship with people. Yeah, explain how that works. Explain 
what prayer really, I mean, <laughs> your illustration is so great. Well, you know, you got all these books for dummies, you know, computer for dummies. And to me, it's the prayer for dummies book. It's, it's as simple as can be. The Bible is the prayer for dummies book. And this is what I mean by that. So we, prayer is essentially asking God to do what he wants to do. I mean, it's just as simple as that. Do what thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I mean, virtually every prayer is asking God to do what he wants to do. And then if you don't know what he wants to do, he's actually done this amazing thing. He's actually written it down for you. So it's like, okay, okay, here I go. Release the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Is that good? He goes, I love that. <laughs> Great idea. I go, you like this. Okay. You know what I mean? And you just, he, he's That's actually so made awesome. it. We read to him what he's written down because we're kind of broken and frail. We forget things. So he's written it down for us. What to say. <laughs> what to say. What to say. I mean, think about it. Think about it. The Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is that good, God? He goes, perfect. Perfect. Say to me what I've written down for you to say. That's prayer. Wow. I mean, so easy a caveman could do it. It is the Geico. I mean, it's, I swear. You could be a knuckle-dragging Neanderthal and be like at the tip of the spear in the prayer movement. And the, the amazing, yeah, as that that awesome. Is that not clear? <laughs> I mean, and the amazing thing is it, it gets heat. It gets, it, it brings it's, the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's, it's it like God works. goes, all right, I'm going to show you. I'm, I'm going to hold back. I've been quoting this Isaiah passage that, you know, he, the Lord waits that he may be gracious to you. That is the most phenomenal statement. He will be very gracious at the sound of your cry when he hears it. Well, even He'll he answer. waits. God waits for us. Isn't that unbelievable? God is waiting for us to agree, to partner. Is that not unbelievable? <laughs> it's awesome. I mean, it is so awesome. And you just, yeah, you just nail that simple concept of prayer. That's going to change the way you think about prayer. You know, we're praying these fellowship prayers. We're praying these trust prayers. Think of it in that light. That's exactly what we're doing. We're just holding up the word of God to God. <laughs> that's awesome. And that's how we do it in our prayer room. We have a, a certain prayer sets that have open mic, and, and we just ask everybody to base their prayer from a Bible verse. And it's amazing because it doesn't matter their background. Everybody agrees that praying the Bible is a good idea, and they'll get up there, and they'll read a Bible verse, and they say, I want to pray from this verse, and then they just begin to pray their heart under the banner of the Scripture. It's the most powerful prophetic thing and uniting thing there is, the Scripture. It's actually given to us to launch us into prayer. Boy, it so keeps prayer out of the ditch of preaching so and depressing prayers and all the, <laughs> oh, my goodness, prayer meetings I've been in that were horrendous. <laughs> People just got up and shared their ideas and told us how bad things are and took faith, sucked faith right out of the room. But when you, when you are praying the Word of God, the Word of God's unbelievably positive. And it's powerful. Yeah, absolutely. It happens to be the most powerful prophetic stuff there is. <laughs> you know, Isaiah 56, he says, I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. And for, I think, a long time we did prayer meetings. We are kind of like rock piling it along, no music. You know, barely prayed the Bible. It was odd a lot of times. A lot of times the prayer people are the odd people. Very odd. <laughs> I've been to a lot of odd But here's what meetings. God's done for us. He's added worship to the prayer, plumb lined us with the Bible, we get to actually be happy, joyful in the house of prayer, and we feel his nearness on our heart. And that's really, I mean, he's so brilliant because he sets up this mechanism by which we have to interface with him. There's all these kingdom things that we're going to do that get to get done, but really, it's about us interfacing with God. It's intimacy. He, he wants relationship with us. He likes us, and he's into flowing back and forth in love with us. You got into this singing thing last night. <laughs> yeah. Go go back into that. I don't even know how well, we got into that. Yeah, well, it's a, see, because we've separated prayer and preaching, because we had the prayer guys over there in the closet, preaching guys out there running, you know, in the fields of who knows where, Timbuktu. And then you got the worship guys, and who knows really what they're doing. You know, they might be waving flags or, you know, who knows? Dancing ballerinas, who, who knows? But... And we've had them in another closet, you yeah, know, another know. corner. Yeah. The thing about it is, 
God has prayer and worship going on at the throne, and it's from that place that he releases all his proclamations. So in his mind, it's always been those three are one reality, prayer, worship, and proclamation, and that's the, the mechanism he's using at the end of the age. So let me show you this verse because there's a bunch of them, but this one is so, it's one of my favorite uh, pictures in the Bible. So Isaiah 42. Um, this is in context to the Lord's return. It, it, he says, you know, he's going to come and release justice to the nations. That's, that's language for the Lord's return. When Jesus comes, he's going to release justice. And so he, uh, he says this uh, in verse 10. He says, because I, I sign up for that. I go, okay, Lord, I want global justice. I want human trafficking to end. I want abortion to end. I want, I want you to do your stuff. I, I, I want the kingdom stuff to happen on the earth. Good. I want justice. I want poverty to end. Yes, I resonate with that. Now, how, what's your plan to do that? And he goes, singing. <laughs> Can we, okay, do we got to plan with a little more teeth? Like, we're going to do what? We're going to sing? He goes, yeah, we're going to put the worship leaders out in front. What well, sounds like Jehoshaphat from yeah, the Old Testament. Does. So he goes, I'm going to bring justice. And then verse 10, Isaiah 42, he says this. Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, the coastlands and you inhabitants of them, the wilderness, he goes on the villages, the, the inhabitants of the mountains. He goes, let them give glory to the Lord. He's talking about global singing, singing across the nations of the earth and let them declare his praise. And then it says in verse 13, the Lord shall go forth like a mighty man. Ooh. He'll go forth like a man of war. And it's saying that at the sound of his bride, singing a global tapestry of prayer, a global tapestry of worship, a global tapestry of proclamation, at that sound of the singing of the bride, it will stir him up in his zeal, and he'll come back like a man of war to take possession of the nations and claim the Father's inheritance that he's promised him. Oh, come on. So, my This goodness. is so good. That is so good. So, that so this means worship movement, think about the worship movement. 35 years ago, you, there was like three tapes yeah, out there. Right. You had Maranatha music, and you had... Uh, we did one. You guys did <laughs> one? You know what I mean? There's four I know, tapes. I know. You had your ch choice of four tapes. Now there's a worship movement with so many songs that are coming from the heart of God. What's that? It's another sign of what God's doing in the earth right now. Oh, my goodness. He's setting the atmosphere. He likes worship. He likes prayer. He's setting the atmosphere because he's getting ready to come here. <laughs> oh, man, I just lost my whole train. I thought I'm, I was going down another track thinking, oh. That's just so amazing to just let your heart just ruminate on that. Uh, okay, let's see if we can get, go down this one and get to where we, uh, we want to be here. I, I know you studied revival in the church. Uh, what does revival look like? What is New Testament revival? Uh, do you see any signs of it? Sure. So my favorite one is, the favorite verse is Acts 3. It says, there are times of refreshing that come from the presence of the Lord. And that times means appointed times. It's a Greek word kairos. It means appointed times of refreshing. And that means literally recovery of life, a recovery of breath. You get your wind back. Hmm. And the Lord says he has these times of refreshing that come from his presence that he's appointed. They're appointed times that he's identified in his calendar. And he says they're going to happen and then it goes on to say that he may send Jesus. And so he actually identifies these times of revival with the end of the age and the Lord's return. And so we've been hearing revival things for years. And some people, you know, revival's taking a bad rap because there's excesses. There's always going to be excesses. Every fire draws flies. <laughs> I'd rather have the fire, though, so good than be know. freezing. Cold, you know. So every fire is going to draw flies. We've got to just try to, you know. Do you know what he's saying there? Every time God moves, weirdness tries to come in. <laughs> Weird, weirdness. I mean, all kinds of weirdness. I, we, can't it's okay. go, we can't go into so, that. I mean, we could spend an hour going into but that. We, but the thing about it is we want the real fire of God. We want the real fire. And so that authenticity in the heart. So God meets that authenticity. 
So here's the thing. He's got this plan, times of refreshing, and he's releasing these movements of the Spirit all over the place. Now, let me tell you about this one. I was in Central Asia. I uh, had the opportunity to travel and meet there with uh, leaders all over the region there. I mean, real apostolic leaders, 500 churches here, 1,000 churches there, Russia. I mean, all these different countries. And uh, the, the buzz that they were all talking about was Iran. Iran, which my mentality of Iran is it's a radical Muslim nation that hates the United States, hates Jesus. And it's because what we see on Fox News and CNN. So you see all these pictures, of these mad crowds, you know. Right. Well, they're all, all these leaders are saying Iran is the revival hotspot of all the nations. Iran. And I go, okay. And they start telling me all these stories about all these Muslims, and they're having dreams and encounters, and they're seeing Jesus, and they're turning to the Lord in mass thousands upon thousands, and they've got pastors of churches that have only been saved. The pastor's only been saved six months, and he's got a thousand people he's trying to tend to in the underground church in Iran. So I'm hearing these stories, and they sound like good preacher stories. You know what I mean? Like just the good story that the preacher tells, and who knows, really. (laughs) And um, and so I'm I'm not trying to be cynical with it, but I'm like, Lord, because it, it's important to my heart. I have a real burning passion for revival. I've prayed for revival in America and in the nations for years. And it's something I'm holding on to God about. And so I go, I, I want to know this one, Lord. I want to know if this is real. And I'm, I'm in Armenia, which is, it butts up next to Iran. And I said, Lord, I just want to, can I just meet one? Of them? I said, as a side little quiet prayer to the Lord, barely even prayed it, thought it, you know, almost. Just, I'd really like to meet one of those guys, Lord, and uh, who's seen Jesus. That's what I mean. I'd like to meet one of those guys that's seen Jesus. And so I'm there for a few days, and there's lots of Iranians coming and going, but I don't meet any of them, and, I, and I'm like, well, I don't know. And so I get on my plane. Well, I'm going to the airport, and they, they rearrange all my flights. I mean, there's a flight that's supposed to originate from where I was at in Yerevan, but instead they rearrange all my flights, and I end up getting on a plane that's originated from somewhere else. It's full of people. And I go and I find my seat, and they're all asleep. I mean, it's early in the morning, and, and they start waking up. Well, the plane has originated from Tehran, <laughs> and it's all Iranians on this plane. And I'm sitting next to this little lady, and I've got my Bible out, and I'm reading, I'm reading the Bible. And she says to me in, in a perfect British accent, she says, are you reading history? I looked at her. I go, uh, no, th- this is a Bible. She goes, oh, a Bible. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And she begins to talk, and she wants to talk about religion and politics. And she begins to tell me, Iranians are so tired of Islam. We're so tired of our government. She goes, all those things you see on the TV with all these mad crowds, she goes, they're all getting paid. She goes, don't believe what you see. And then she says this to me. I'm just going, this is unbelievable. And she just, she just looks at me, and she just goes, you know, I've seen him. I said, you've seen him? Who, who him? Who, who's the him? She said, I've seen Jesus three times. Oh, man. Oh, man. She said, I've seen him three times in dreams. She said, the last time I've saw, I saw him was two weeks ago. I'm sorry. Oh, man, you're doing it to me, too. Hmm. And she said, he was standing at the end of my bed, and he was, and she begins to describe Revelation 1, which she hasn't even read. She said, he was wearing a white garment, and he was glowing beautifully, and his face was shining. And I said, that's in the Bible. She says, it's in the Bible. I go, yes, that's what he looks like. And she said, and he was doing this. He was beckoning me to come to him. And then she says to me, I know that's why you're here. (laughs) Oh. She, sent, she says, he sent you to me. I'm sure of it. And I, I'm condensing a five-hour conversation. I get to share the gospel. I get to break down things that she thought that were not true and twisted things that she'd had from Islam. I get to break it all down. And, and, I, and, I'm, and, she's, and, and, and I'm sitting there and I'm going, Lord, I just want to pray for this lady. I, I just, I want, because she had some physical issues. And I go, Lord, I just, I just, give me the sentence to say that will make her open for me to pray for her. And I just pray that prayer. I finish it, and I'm going to turn to her and say, could I pray for you? 
And, and she says, would you pray for me? I said, yes, I will pray for you. And I pray for her. And, and I just say, her name is Suzanne. I said, Suzanne, call on the name of the Lord. All those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, and she said, I believe that. I believe Jesus is drawing me. And I ended up carrying her bags to the airport and all this stuff. I missed my next flight. and <laughs> got stuck in London. I was blown away. But I asked, I, I interviewed her. I said, are there lots of people coming to Jesus in Iran? She said, all over the country. Thousands upon thousands are turning away from Islam. And they're coming to Jesus. That's on the That's on the And I'll tell you what. This global prayer movement, this movement of prayer where people like you and I, our hearts are getting stirred. I, I'm the last guy. I didn't think I would be in prayer, like mm -mm. prayer. Mm -mm. And I love it now, but I tell you, God is releasing the incense of prayer. He's releasing prayer all over the globe. And the answers are coming in the Iranian revival with Muslims being encountered with visions of Jesus in the night. Oh, this is what man. he's doing here at the end of the age. We're in a, such yeah. a beautiful time, beloved. Billy, how do we get in on what God's doing? <laughs> how do we get in on that, man? How do we I get think warrior you're in. hearts? You know, um, I've, bo I've, I've boiled Christianity down to this. Each of us has one sign in our left hand and one sign in our right. The sign in the right hand says yes. The sign in the left hand says no. Use the yes sign with God, the no sign with the devil, and it'll turn out okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so... Oh. All we got to do is just say, use that, use that sign. Yes. Yes, God. If he's stirring our hearts. He's doing it here. Your city is so important, I think, in, in so many different ways. There's strategic things here. There's such a heritage in your city. There's such a heritage in this church. Of, I mean, a testimony of faithfulness for, year, for decades. Ron Tucker, faithful for years and years and years. And the fresh thing God's doing in your heart it's such a sign of what he's doing in so many places. How do you get, use the yes sign. Just use the yes sign. And we'll do it, man, we'll bumble through this. Yeah. I call it magooing into the thing. <laughs> Remember magoo? <laughs> Coke bottle glasses kind of bumbling around. Man, that's the best any of us are going to do. We're all weak and broken. There's one perfect guy. His name is Jesus. He's the star of the kingdom. We get to get in on his story. We just say yes. Billy, th this, this is a God thing, you being with us this weekend, man. You have, oh, man, I know our hearts have been ignited. I know some of you have been looking at me crossways on these prayers, that prayer lists that I've been encouraging you to pray, the fellowship and trust prayers. This is why we're doing it. We want to be in the middle of this. We want to be in the middle of what God is saying to us. I don't even know what that is. I don't know what that means. <laughs> But, uh, he's a good leader. Yeah, We're horrible a, followers. We say yes. Yes. We're going to hold up that sign. <laughs> I want Billy to pray for us. I want him to pray for our church and pray for you. And uh, so lead us yeah. in some prayer here. Let you know, I, I just want to say this. If, if, if this. if this resonates with your heart, if you feel like, man, I don't know what all this is, but man, pastor's lit up and God's doing something and my heart's resonating with that. <laughs> I, if this feels right to you in any way, I just want to invite you, as I pray for you, I just want to invite you to stand. I just want to ask the Lord to touch us. So that's you. Yeah, just stand. As this is resonating with your heart, let's just stand together. Oh, thank you, Lord. I love how God leads. Oh, I do too. Mm. Thank you. So Jesus, we are here because of you and for you. Yes. There's one trophy in the trophy case at the end of the age and it's grace the grace of God has won the race for us and though Lord that we have been at times weak and broken and wayward your grace carries us through oh, Lord. so Lord right now I pray for Grace Church and I ask you release grace to pray yes. grace to worship Grace to love Jesus. Yes. I thank you so much for the wind of the spirit that's blowing in this place, yes. that refreshing wind drawing us into intimacy. And Lord, we just say yes right now. Yes. I pray, raise up the prayer movement, the praying church, even in this place. Yes. 
Lord, you said your house should be called a house of prayer. Do it here at Grace Church. Release the spirit of grace and supplication. God, I thank you for the years of faithfulness, the testimony and the heritage of faith that's here. Lord, I thank you for the beautiful thing you're doing right now in this season. So, Lord, do it again. Fresh grace to pray, to worship, to seek your face. We say yes, Lord. Thank you for it. Jesus' name.